I know what you're thinking. Um, who is this overweight, beardy man who's replaced Rob? So let me uh, tell you, I work for a company called My Builder, and we are passionate about connecting homeowners with great builders, and we help great builders succeed with their businesses. And we are hiring. So if you like uh, what I'm doing today, if you like the look of me and you want to join a team that's, uh, that's close-knit and supportive and passionate about what they do, come and talk to me or tweet me or whatever afterwards and we'll, uh, we'll get talking. So a note about the code. There is going to be some code in this presentation, uh, but we're thinking more about the theory of things, so you don't need to follow along. You don't need to understand things. The code examples are going to be symphony, I know some of you, might, that might not be your bag so much, but uh, that's the way I roll. So back on track, running your PHP project on AWS Lambda, or as I like to call it, coupling yourself to AWS for fun and profit. So why would we want to do this? Let's think about the evolution of a typical kind of small to medium sized web app. You might start with an EC2 box. Uh, which is running everything, and later on you think, ah, let's put on an RDS database. And then you find out that you can get free SSL certificates with AWS, so you think, fantastic, let's do that. But then that comes with the caveat that it has to be attached to a load balancer, which costs you $20 a month, so then you're paying $240 a year, you might as well have just bought the SSL certificate in the first place. What? So, a bit later on, as your site starts getting traffic, you think, well, I need to scale. So you end up adding more and more EC2 boxes behind your, uh, behind your load balancer. This is all costing you a lot of money. Wouldn't it be great if we could just get rid of a load of that? Uh, we still need to pay for the data store at the moment. But if we could get rid of most of that cost, that would be fantastic. Well, let's introduce functions as a service, uh, also known as serverless. And AWS's uh, offering of that is Lambda. So the way to think of it is as a server that doesn't exist until you need it, until you make a request to it, and then it goes away again. It doesn't exist until it's needed again. So let's think about the anatomy of how that might look. Um, so you start off with a container, and inside that is some bootstrap code, and that sits there waiting for the request to come in. When a request comes in, that bootstrap code calls your application code, this is when you start getting charged, when your application code is running. And then when that request goes back, you stop getting charged. You've stopped paying for that, but that, bootstrap still, that container is still bootstrapped and still waiting for the next request. The trouble is, running PHP on Lambda was a complete pain in the ass until quite recently. So a lot of articles on the internet all revolved around the same thing. It said, right, start your Lambda function, create a Lambda function in one of the supported languages at the time, which was Go or JavaScript or Java or C Sharp or Python. So you'd create maybe a, a JS handler, and when the request came in, it would call a PHP binary which you have to supply, which then calls your application code, and then returns back to the uh, back to the client. At the end of last year, AWS introduced something called layers, and a bunch of documentation about it. It kind of opened up the possibility to have different programming languages, any program la programming language you want running on AWS Lambda. There are some things to note here. You can have up to five different layers running in a Lambda function. The total unzipped code of everything has to be less than 250 megabytes. And by default, you get 1,000 concurrent invocations of Lambda per region. That's across all of your functions. You can increase that if, you're, uh, if your traffic uh, warrants it, but it's, it's kind of a, a, a procedure in place to stop you exponentially running up your, your AWS bill. So let's think about how that might look now. So this is what we had previously, and we've now got this. this our bootstrap is now. Uh, including the PHP layer, and we've got a little handler that we can shim in there as well. And this is sitting waiting for the request to come in. So our request comes in. Now we only pay for our framework code or our application code. And everything gets sent back to the client, and we stop paying for that at that point. The trouble is, it's still a pain in the ass. You have to supply the layer, and you have to 
supply of the bootstrap. Well, what we have... Oh, apparently I can't click from over there. Right. There is a website, bref.sh. Now, bref is uh, French for brief. It kind of um, references the, the, the brief nature of lambdas that exists only when you need it. Very, very, very um, kind of ephemeral and, and very time-constrained. Now, Breath's goal is to make running PHP apps on Lambda simple. How does it achieve that? Well, it simplifies problems by removing choices. You don't get the kitchen sink thrown in. What we do is we give you simple and familiar solutions so that uh, you can extend them if you want, but things will always run the same, and they should be stable, and they should be predictable. I'm also empowered by sharing knowledge, um, which is a way, basically, of saying we don't want to hide complexity behind leaky abstractions. We'll give you what you need, and it's well documented, and that's, uh, and that's what you get. So what does Bref actually do? Well, that's a very good question. I'm so glad you asked it. Bref provides simple and clear documentation. It supplies cake, uh, layers even, not cake. Um, and it aims to support the frameworks. Now, PHP, plain old PHP, runs on Bref. Laravel runs on Bref. Symfony runs on Bref. I know these for a fact because I've done them. I believe we've got Slim working with it. And there's no reason why like Magento and, and PHP BB or anything else wouldn't be able to work with it now. Previously, on, uh, before the layers was announced, it would have been a nightmare trying to do that. But now we can do that. We can, there's no reason why we wouldn't be able to support any framework, to be honest. And we have something called SAM, which is an AWS package which deals with the actual deployment. Um, I like to think of this as a guy called Sam who's deploying some lunch somewhere. So what SAM does is takes what we have here, this, this architecture, and it pushes it up to, uh, to AWS and puts an API gateway front in, uh, on it as well. Now, what you can do is attach your SSL certificate to API Gateway, and you've actually got your free SSL that we've all been, you know, the holy grail that we were, we were looking for. So let's dive in. I've got here just a very simple hello world.php, which is going to echo out hello world and then give me some PHP info. So I'm going to require the breath project and go back. Well, nothing's actually changed. So I need to run the init script. So it's vendor, bif, uh, vendor bin breath init. If we have a look at the output here, it's saying to me, what kind of Lambda function do I want to create? Well, I want to be able to look at this in my browser. I want to go to the PHP info and see what's happening and see that hello world. So I'm going to select number one. And you can see there it's created for me an index.php and a template.yaml file. I'm going to delete the index.php. I don't want it. And let's look at the, the template.yaml. It's big and it's scary. So the thing to do is go straight into it and see what's going on. We can see here we've got a resources section, which has got my function here. And I've got a function name. And I've got a, a pointer to an index.php uh, file. And obviously, I've deleted that index.php, so I need to point that to my hello world. And I'm just going to change the name of the, uh, the, the Lambda function that it's, that's, uh, that it's going to create as well to so breath hello world. If we look here as well, we've got the layer configuration. Now, Bref has automatically created this for me, um, but it's put the layer in uh, it's referencing US East 1. So I'm going to change that to EU West 1. Uh, regions will come back and haunt you at some point. They do with me all the time. So just always be aware that if anything goes wrong, it's probably because you've knackered up your, your regions. And if we look here, we've got a couple of routing definitions here. So we've got the, uh, the root path. It just, that just says to API Gateway, anything that matches the root path is going to be handled by this function. And again, HTTP subpaths, it's not really relevant here, but for, for uh, applications with routing and uh, multiple URLs, it's all, it's, what it will do is match that and send that all to your application as well. So how do we test locally? I'm going to install the uh, AWS SAM CLI using Homebrew. By the way, Linux users, if you haven't used Linux Brew yet, I suggest you do that. It's a, it's a really, really good method of using homebrew stuff on Linux. Um, so I'm just going to tap the AWS tap and then install the SAM CLI. 
once that's done, I can start the CLI, uh, sorry, start the, uh, the SAM local API in my, uh, in my project folder. And it tells me that I need Docker. OK, so I need to start Docker. Now, if I start uh, SAM local again, it tells me it's running locally on port 3000. Fantastic. I can go now to there in my browser and see what I get. I've got an error. OK, there's something that I need to do here, clearly. Um, and if I look at the console, it's told me, look, I've got an invalid layer name. But I know that that layer is valid. That's what Breath provided me. And I know that that layer is, is a valid layer. So what's happened? It's regions. My AWS profile is set to US East 1 by default, and I forgot to set it as West 1. So I've got two things I can do. I can either set my profile default, or I can just tag on the region at the end here. This is the simplest thing to do just to get things running. This time, when I go to that uh, URL in my browser, the console output tells me it's going to download the layer, and it's going to build the image. So the first time you access it, it takes maybe a minute or so to get going. To, to download and build the image. And we can see here, I've got a Lambda-esque environment running locally with my Hello World and my, and my uh, PHP info there. It's not that impressive, is it, to be honest? So let's think now about how we can deploy and actually make that run somewhere in the cloud on, uh, on top of AWS's stack. The first thing I need to do is create a deployment bucket. This is where the artifacts are going to go. I only need to do this once per, uh, per Lambda function that I'm creating, or per, per project that I'm creating. So once I've run that, it comes back and it says, hey, look, I've made the bucket for you. Your breath hello world is, is right there. Now I can copy and paste the deployment commands from the uh, breath documentation on the website. So the first one is to create the package which is going to be so uh, the output template file. Think of the output template file as kind of being a bit like a composer.lock. It's going to lock things down. It's going to say, this is a deployment configuration that we're going to use. Uh, and the S3 bucket, of course, is the S3 bucket I've just created. When I run it, what happens is uh, Sam CLI gives me a bunch of information. It says, yeah, I've done that, and I've created the, uh, the stack.yaml file. And if I go into my S3 console, I can see that I've got the bucket created, and I've got that artifact that it was just telling me about there. Quite helpfully, um, Sam also says, hey, look, run this cloud formation uh, command, and then we'll actually deploy the thing. So I'm going to take that put in the name of the stack that I want to create, which is Breath Hello World, and I'm going to run that. And Sam tells me it's got an error. Something to do with capabilities I am, blah, blah, blah. I don't care. I'm going to go back to the Breath website and see what, uh, what command I actually should have run. So uh, Breath documentation says, look, that other command that Sam gives you isn't going to work. This is the one that you need to do. So Sam deploy, blah, blah, blah. Again, the stack name, breath hello world. This time when we create it, I've got another error. Errors, you're going to run into errors the first time you do this thing. And these are all errors that I genuinely made yesterday when I was putting, putting things together. You're going to run into errors. At this, time, at this point, I'm bored of doing things in the console. I want something visual. So I can go into CloudFormation. I can see that uh, something's gone wrong. And I can drill down into the details. And it says, the bucket is in the wrong region. I've, I've made that same mistake again. OK, so what I decided to do at this point was delete the stack, delete the bucket, and start again, this time creating the bucket in the correct region. And it was at this point that I decided to put the region in my AWS profile, uh, in, my, in my credentials file. So now I can create the, uh, the bucket, and I can do package. And I can do the deploy, again, using the, uh, the command that's actually on the Breath website rather than what Sam tells me to do. And this time, I've got a stack created. How cool is that? Yeah, all right, you're not impressed. OK, so this time, in CloudFormation, let's have a look what we've got. Let's explore what's happened. So I've got the stack is created. If I go to API Gateway, you can see I've got this whole thing that's been created here for me. Um, and we've got all the way here, so we've got the API gateway stuff. And then right at the end, right on the right-hand side here, we've got this is where it's going to proxy through to your 
lambda function we've created, which is kind of similar to what we had in this diagram. Right, so we've got, we don't have as much information on the API gateway side, and we've got more information on the Lambda stuff on this diagram, but it's the same sort of thing. Now, if I go to my Lambda console, I can see that I've got this, uh, this function's been created. I've got an inline code editor with my PHP in it. And if I look at the layers configuration here, I can see that I've got that layer in the EU West 1 region. The, I, uh, the ARN, the URI for that, was copied from the Bref website. And if I go to API Gateway configuration here, I've got a couple of, down the bottom here, I've got a couple of uh, endpoints that I can go to in my browser. So if I open that up, Look at this. I've got that Hello World application with PHP Info running remotely on a server that existed just to return that PHP Info and doesn't exist anymore until I refresh the page. And if I keep refreshing the page, it brings that, that server back up, sends the response back, and then goes away again. The logs from that go to CloudWatch. So I can open up CloudWatch, and after I'd refreshed a few times, I kind of had a look at what was going on. So I've got all of these requests, and they're kind of they're, they're running for like the duration for these uh, flitters between what six milliseconds and 100, 280, I think milliseconds is the longest. So the first one, the longest one, that's 280 milliseconds, was the first request where it had to build the uh, the container and do the bootstrapping, and then get PHP FPM up and running. So that's why it takes a little bit longer. But the rest of them, they're, they're, they're kind of quick. They're not, they're not ridiculously fast just yet. But they're, you know, they're, they're quite reasonable, I think. And if we look here, so I just want to draw your attention to this. We've got this, t right at the beginning of the log, we've got this entry about uh, PHP FPM coming up and being ready to handle connections. That's the only time that appears in that log. That means, that, that kind of confirms that what we were saying about once it's bootstrapped, it's there, your bootstrap is working, and that's still running and waiting for the requests. So they, it doesn't need to re-bootstrap PHP FPM with each request. Now, what about if you've got your own domain name that you want to use on that? Because let's be honest, that's, that's an ugly URL, right? And we've got this weird prod thing at the end of it. What's that all about? Well, that's something that API Gateway uses. Uh, it's called the stage name. But I don't like that. I don't want to have that in my URLs. Now, let's assume, for example, that you really like cats. And each time you do a presentation, in fact, you're obsessed with cats. And each time you do a presentation, you set up a new domain name that's something to do with cats. And for the sake of this one, you've set up a website called kittyquotes.net, which, which combines your, your passion for puns and kittens. Um, and what we want to do is just kind of as a proof of concept, we want to use that domain name for Hello World and attach that to our Hello World Lambda that we've just created. What I'm going to do is, in API Gateway, I'm going to click Custom Domain Names. It's, it's kind of a, kind of simple when, uh, when you realize it's there. You click Custom Domain Names, and you put in there Hello world.kittyquotes.net as the, as the domain name. And I can select what SSL certificate I want to use but it has to be in the US East 1 region. If you have uh, certificates in any other region, it won't work. You have to transfer them to US East 1 to make this work. So I click Save. All right, OK, so it takes a little while to get that all running. In the meantime, we can make a cup of tea, and we can then add some base path mappings. Now, what that does is says, look, when something comes in to kittyquotes.net, to that, to that uh, root path, I want the destination to be that, uh, that stack that I've created. And we're going to send it to that prod stage. Then I've got my uh, CloudFront URL that it's created. And I can take that, I can copy that, and I can go to my Route 53 configuration, and I can create an alias. Uh, I'm going to create an A record there as an alias and just paste that in. Um, you can do a C name if you want to do a C name, but the difference, as far as I'm aware, between uh, doing an A record alias and a C name 
is that with a C name, you get charged per lookup, whereas with aliases, you don't. So you can save a little bit more, uh, little bit more money in that respect. This time, if I go to hello-world.kittyquotes.net, I have got a fancy green padlock in my, uh, in my address bar. And I've got my hello world, and I've got my PHP info running. Again, this is, this is totally ephemeral. So, so that server only exists when the request is being made. And it goes away again, which is, I, I think that's kind of cool. So we've just gone through quite a bit there. So let's, let's recap what we've done. We've looked at how functions as a service can simplify our architecture and save us a bit of money. We're not paying for a server to run 24-7. We don't have to pay for a load balancer. Um, you know, we're, we're only paying for stuff that we're actually using when we're using it. We've installed the uh, AWS SAM CLI. We've added breath into our project. We've had a quick look at the template.yaml file. We've tested with SAM local. Uh, we've created our deployment bucket. We have packaged and deployed our application. We've had a look at the stack that it's created. Uh, we've tested the application. We've had a look at the logs, and we've added a custom domain name. Now, it didn't take long at all. We've done a lot there, but it didn't take long at all. We've also run into a few errors on the way. But what about fully featured websites? Is it possible to take a, uh, you know, a, a, a normal website, your, your kind of web applications that you're running, your blogs and, and your, you know, your, your business uh, storefront, and run that on, on Lambda? Let's find out, eh? Now, imagine that a website called kittyquotes.net exists, and this is the local version of it running on the uh, local web server. So we've, what we've got here is uh, some content returned from a database, and we've got some CSS, we've got some JavaScript, we've got some uploaded images of, of kittens. We've got a back-end system, with, uh, which is uh, secured with... Um, uh, it's actually with Symfony's user management. And we've got an admin panel, uh, which, is from a, uh, which is from a community bundle. And we've got an uploading mechanism from a uh, plugin for the admin panel. So let's, let's have a look at what we can do to convert this. We've got some things to remember, though. Only the temp directory on Lambda is writable. So I can't put things where I'm used to putting them. I'm going to run into problems. And we also have to remember that the total unzip size of the code and the layers has to be less than 250 megabytes. So with those two red lines in place, let's see what we can do. I'm going to require breath, and I'm going to initialize it. And again, this is going to be an HTTP application that I'm going to go to in my browser. So I'm going to choose option number one there. If we look at the template.yaml, what I've done here, I've made a couple of adjustments already. So I'm changing the function name to breath kitty quotes. In the Lambda console uh, on the website, I want to be able to identify this, so I'm calling it breath kitty quotes. I am pointing to the public index.php, which is the Symfony default entry point uh, to, to the application. And I've increased the memory size that's allowed for my, for my uh, Lambda function to run. Um, by default, I think Lambda sets it to 128 megabytes, which then means it takes forever to return a request, and you're paying for more time on the Lambda. Um, it seems kind of counterintuitive, but if, if you increase the memory size, you pay for more memory, but you pay for less time to run that, and so you end up saving a bit of money in that respect. And I've changed the name of the resource to web application. Um, the reason for that will become clear a bit later on, uh, but let's move on from there. So I'm going to start the API again so I can just test this locally, and straight away I've got an exception. And the reason being is because I forgot the very thing that I told you to remember, which is that only the temp file system is writable. So the thing to do is go into my kernel.php and configure the framework 
to write to temp instead. We've got access to this environment variable, which is, am I running on Lambda? So I can just override the get cache direction, uh, directory method in the kernel and say, if I'm on Lambda, then we put the cache into, uh, into the temp. And we can do the same thing with the logs as well. But maybe it's better to, to use monolog or something to push your logs somewhere else uh, for, for this. Trouble is now I'm getting a PDO exception. It can't find the PDO driver, uh, which is obviously kind of a problem. If, you know, if you've got a database-backed site, you need to be able to access stuff from the database, right? Now, the reason for that, let me just go over there again. The reason for that is because Breath tries to keep everything very, very small and very, very optimized and very, very uh, fast. It doesn't want to make choices for you. It wants you to make these decisions. So we've got some extensions are enabled by default. They're installed and enabled. And we've got PDO there, and we've got PDO SQLite, and one or two other bits and pieces that are going to be kind of, a, kind of requisite for a lot of applications. And we've got some extensions which are installed but disabled. And one of those is the my SQL PDO driver. So how do, I, how do I make that work? Well, it's documented on the Breath website. All you need to do is create a PHP slash conf.d directory, and inside there, put php.ini in, and then say extension equals PDO MySQL. Simple. And what happens is things start working then. But now we need to set up a database connection. If you remember, like currently our, our uh, architecture looks like this. What we want to do is connect to our data store. Optionally, we can put it inside a VPC, um, and we'll talk about VPCs in a bit. VPC would obviously uh, increase security uh, by making sure that only the Lambda can ever uh, connect to that database. At the moment, there are performance implications with that, and we'll talk about that a bit later on. Now, what we can do, in the template.yaml, we can define environment variables. So I can just put the database URL in there. But that's not necessarily a good idea. Before you do that, let's think about where this file is going to end up. Are we going to commit this file? Are we going to end up putting our database username and password in a file that we're going to push on GitHub and then maybe make public at some point. Uh, we don't want to do that. So it might be a better option to put some kind of placeholder into the template.yaml file and then just define that actual variable later on in the, uh, in the Lambda application console. So now on SAM local, I have got uh, my database backed uh, content coming out. And I've also got the CSS and the, and the JS and the images all working fine. So let's, uh, let's think about deploying this. So I'm going to create my bucket. And I'm going to package it. And this time, I'm making sure that the bucket and everything is all in the region I want it to be. And then I'm going to deploy it using that deploy, uh, deploy command that was on the Breath website. I'm completely ignoring Sam's uh, suggestion for this now. But I've got an error. OK. Let's see what the error is. When I drill into it in the, uh, in the CloudFormation events, it says the unzip size must be smaller than 150 megabytes. Great. OK. So let's think about what we're trying to do. What can we do? We can remove maybe the dev dependencies. In Symfony, the full stack framework comes with um, a bunch of stuff that you can install with Yarn for, for uh, running your Encore stuff and, and generating your assets. I don't need the node modules when I'm on production, so I can delete that. But the problem is that that doesn't go far enough. The, the deployment package is still too big. So we think, oh, OK, let's remove the cache before deploy. And let's think about removing my PHP storm configuration. Let's think about removing. The trouble is, these are all necessary. You need all of these on your local development. 
So it, this, this isn't the right solution for that. And currently, we're, we're kind of discussing the best way of, of trying to attack this. Um, I'll say, actually, if you're deploying from continuous integration or something, you don't have this problem because things like your PHP Storm configuration isn't in your CI. And neither, neither is uh, your, your Git working um, configuration. So you don't, you don't need that. You can just pull and do a composer install with the optimizer autoloader and, and everything. And, that, and you'll never get the node modules. And that will all be fine. That will be much, much smaller. At the moment, if you're going to deploy locally from a laptop, um, what you can do, and currently the way we document it, is to make a copy of your project, get rid of what you don't need, and upload the, um, the optimized version. So with that, I've created just a very simple bash script. I say simple, it, it looks scary. Uh, but there's a bash script that, that I run from a different directory, and it says, copy everything, apart from the, uh, the, the hidden files. So it copies everything, and then remove the stuff that's in the cache, remove the node modules, install only the basic stuff, and optimize it at the same time. Warm up the cache. Now, that's, that's a very small performance optimization that we can make by warming the cache. But it means that we don't have to warm a, a, a cold cache on that first request on Lambda. It's pre-warmed. Um, and then we package, and then we deploy. And things start working now, because I'm, I'm making code edits in my editor in one directory. And that deploy script, um, once I've created it, like, I can just keep hitting deploy, and it will do everything for me. So it's created my stack. And I can go to it in my browser. And I've got my database-backed content. But what I don't have, which is what we had with uh, Sam Local, was all of the assets, the, the images and the, um, uh, the CSS and the JS. And that's, that's kind of, I stopped using Sam Local at that point, because it's, it's similar to Lambda, but it's not quite similar enough. So we need to fix this. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to put our CSS and JavaScript on a CDN, which, if you're going down the serverless route, you probably should be doing anyway. And I'm sure uh, you know, many of you are probably already using CDNs right now. Um, it's well documented in Symfony. It's well documented in Laravel and probably any other framework that you want to use how to achieve this. So I'm just going to copy and paste some code. And I'm going to say, look, I've got this bucket set up, and I've uploaded those assets to that bucket. So this is where you need to go. And then when I recompile the front end assets and deploy, I've got my CSS back. And I can log in. The trouble is my back end is looking a little bit weary. Uh, I don't have those back end ass assets that, uh, that I thought I'd have. So what do I need to do? I need to tell my uh, PHP templates where to look for those assets as well. Once I've done that and deployed, I've got this easy admin back. There's something quite obvious missing, though, which is these images. And we'll get to that in just a bit. But first of all, as I'm clicking around, I get kicked out. And it happens. It happens as I'm trying to do stuff, I get kicked. The reason for that is because I've got my Lambda function here, and my sessions exist on that Lambda function. Now, there's no guarantee when I make another request, I'm going to hit that same Lambda container. And, my, and I might have a session on a different container. And I need some way of being able to combine the two. And of course, the, uh, one of the options is to put the sessions into the data store. Again, it's well documented for Laravel. It's well documented for uh, Symfony. And it's the, the, the theory and the, um, the kind of methods of doing so don't really change. Uh, so I am just going to copy and paste the Symfony configuration for it. And of course, I need to make the change on the, uh, on the database itself. So I've created a migration, but now I'm, I've got this problem. I need to run that on my remote database to add the sessions table so I can store sessions in there. How do I do that? How do I need to configure that connection locally so I can run this locally, or can I run that 
on the Lambda environment. Well, we need to be able to run console commands. In template.yaml, uh, and now it should become clear why I renamed that resource to web application before, because now I've added another resource called console. And I'm including that first layer, the uh, PHP 7.3 layer, and I'm also adding a second layer here, which gives me access to the console. And what I've also done is put that database environment variable into a global variable. That makes that variable uh, accessible to both the web app and to the console app. So I can move that out and only define that in one place. Now I need to run the command. So locally I can do uh, vendor bin bref CLI and then the name of the function I want to invoke. And I put a double dash and then the name of the command I want to run, which is migrations migrate force. And what happens is it comes back and it tells me, I've done this change to your database. We are all good, which is great. I can click around and I can do stuff, and I'm not going to get kicked anymore. And it also means that when I redeploy, my users aren't going to get kicked because their sessions are just going to be retrieved back from that, uh, that database table again. So now let's think about the images that we're missing. What I have done now is, uh, so we've got this, this architecture. And what I have done is added a file store, just an S3 bucket. And I've already moved all of the images across to there. Uh, but I need to reference that within the application. So I can just use, again, environment variables and say, this is where you need to look for the, uh, for the uploads for those, for those cats. And in the, uh, the back end, it works. And my front end templates, I'm going to point to the same environment variable. And I've got those cats on the front end again as well. But how do we upload new cats? I've already moved all the old ones over. How do I upload new cats? It's a very valid question. There are different ways of doing it, but one way is to use pre-signed URLs. Um, let's have a show of hands how many people have used pre-signed URLs who hasn't used one but knows what one is. Good, I get to show you some YAML now, uh, some uh, UML now. OK, so we start off with a client. Our client will be our web browser. And the web browser says to the server, hey, look, I want to upload something. Can you get me a URL that I can use? And that URL will have a token in it. And the server says to Amazon S3, hey, listen, somebody wants to upload something. Give me a URL that they can use to access, uh, to, to, to upload to. And Amazon says to the server, yeah, sure, here it is. Here's, here's the URL. Here's everything you need. And the server says, back to the browser. Here you go. And then the browser says directly to Amazon, hey, look, here's that thing that you're expecting that, that the server told you that I was going to upload. And Amazon says, great, fantastic, brilliant. And then the client says back to the server, look, I've done that. I've pushed it up. You can update your record. And then optionally, the server can say to S3, hey, look, all right, that's done. We've got the new file. We can delete the old one. That is pre-signed URLs in a nutshell. The idea is that the server pre-authenticates for the client. And then the client goes ahead and completes what was uh, completes the upload. So what I've done is added a controller here with two routes in it. One is uh, to upload a kitty image, and the other one is to get the pre-signed URL. The content of those uh, those methods isn't important right now, but that's 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 what we have. And I've added some JavaScript to. Uh, which is where the client does the interaction between the server and to S3. Yes, it's jQuery. Don't hate me. Um, and what I can do now is actually remove that third-party uploading bundle that I had. And from my entities, I can re remove all of the code that was related to that as well. So I'm kind of cleaning up my entities a little bit by removing stuff that I didn't necessarily want in there. It felt a bit dirty putting it in there. Uh, so I can remove all that anyway. 
And the great thing is now I can select any kitty in the list, and I can click this Upload Kitty Image button. I can select a cat, and you can see that it's changed. Uh, so there's no actual uploading happening to Lambda or to my, my server itself. What we've got is uh, the client saying, hey, let's stick this straight on Amazon, but let the server know when we've done it. So let's have a recap now at what we've just done. We've added breath to an existing site. We've fixed the assets that were broken by moving them over to a CDN. We've moved the session storage to a database. We've run console commands to migrate the database. And we've, uh, we've put pre-signed URLs in to handle image uploading. We've now got a completely serverless uh, website. And it didn't take long to do. Yay! So let's think about performance. Cold boots, for a start. Remember I told you about VPCs and their performance implications? Um, Amazon have promised, or they've told us, that they're going to fix this uh, early this year. So we're, we're almost kind of getting to mid-2019. So hopefully, this will be coming soon. But the trouble with cold boots is, if we remember, so we go from nothing, and it creates the container, and it bootstraps your runtime, and then starts waiting for, um, waiting for requests right at the end here, where it says warm start. So the cold start is everything that comes before that, where it sets up FPM and, and all the rest. When your code is in a VPC, it adds load, it adds work to that cold start which means that you get extra security, but your cold boots are very, very long. Well, how long, you might ask? Depends on the memory you assign to your Lambda function. If you only have 128 megabytes on your Lambda function, it takes 11 seconds to start that container. If you add more memory, it brings it down, it brings it down, it brings it down. Um, so hopefully, this is going to be fixed very, very, very soon so that we can all have really fast, really secure Websites. You know, until then, you've got to choose. Another option is to, to keep the VPCs warm. And you can use services like Pingdom uh, to do that. If you're using Pingdom anyway to monitor your uptime, then you've kind of got that for free. And you reduce the chance of your users getting that 10 or 11 second wait. But it feels kind of hacky. And I'd much rather Amazon just fixed it. Now. All I want for Christmas is fast PHP Lambda, which, uh, which Kieran said in, uh, in, in the Slack channel uh, some time ago now. Well, look, we're, the layers thing gives us options to, to, to explore performance. We couldn't do that before. When we had the shim and we were pushing the, the, the JS shim and we were pushing the binary up with that and trying to call that, we just didn't have that option. With layers, we can. We can experiment, because we completely control the type of server that runs. Now, we've got some performance benchmarks, some early performance benchmarks, which, um, which were created by the guy who initially wrote Bref. And the two that we've got here, so the lower one here, uh, which is option E, which is running PHP FPM, the fastest we've got PHP down to is about one millisecond response. And we've got an average of 18 milliseconds for a symphony response. Option A, which, is, uh, which has got the little warning sign next to it and is experimental uh, using um, PHP React kind of uh, ideas with shared memory and, and those kind of things here, be dragons. Uh, we've got a symphony response down to six milliseconds. That's three times faster on average for using that. And let's say we have these options, and there are many, many more things that we can do to try to improve this. But how much further can we go? What about microservices? What about if you're using messaging and SNS uh, and, and reacting to that with Lambda? You, you don't need uh, an HTTP application or a console app, what you need is just a function that's going to receive the, um, receive the event and act upon it. 
Well, you can do. We give you that option. You can say, I want to create a PHP function, choose option zero, and you're away. You get that event. And the great thing about that is then you can use the same code to send your message as you do to receive it. You can, if you've got validation, you can, you can serialize in PHP, send it through SNS, and then unserialize it through PHP, and you get back the exact same object. Now, I know you're all wondering now, how do I roll my own? Because we don't give you a lot in those layers. You want to be able to do things. There are a couple of options here. Um, it's all kind of new ground for us. There is a company um, who are getting fully involved in the project, and they've created a bunch of extensions to help you create layers if you want. The other option right now is to clone the breath project, and then you can open up the Docker file which we compile PHP from, add in anything that you want, and then just run make publish. And then what happens is your laptop fans go crazy for about 10 minutes, and it uploads the layers for you. And that's exactly what I did when I was playing with getting WordPress running. I needed my SQL I extension, which we don't provide in Breath. So I thought, well, let's go in and let's do that, and let's add my SQL I, which is, which is interesting. Like I said, we can probably start supporting anything in PHP with enough time, with enough uh, resources to, to kind of play with it and do it. Um, so does WordPress work with Breath? Well, sort of. This is as far as I got after nearly breaking my laptop with those fans running for forever. Um, it's an old laptop. It doesn't really like doing much these days. Um, but we got it compiled and we got it running. But I don't have enough experience with um, WordPress to be with, with, with developing WordPress locally with a remote database and all the rest. And each time, I don't know, I just don't know enough about WordPress to really pursue it any further. So if anybody that knows WordPress can get involved and, and kind of go, hey, look, here's how we do it uh, with a remote database and all the rest, then that would be, be pretty cool. I think we can support WordPress quite easily. Wouldn't it be great if we could put in layers for like Blackfire and do deep profiling on things that are happening within, within Lambda? That's something before layers. We wouldn't have been able to do that. We'd have been reliant upon the, um, the logs that you get within uh, AWS with, uh, for, for CloudWatch metrics and things like that. But now we can think about, yeah, we could add a layer for this. I would love for that to happen. This is my own AWS billing console. I started playing with Breath around August last year. And look here. I have completely eliminated my load balancing cost. Completely. And my other EC2 costs are coming down. I've got one EC2 server left. Uh, and that's because I haven't yet emailed the guy that's got the only site left on it to say that I'm shutting the server down. And when I do that, then I will have zero EC2 costs. I think that's pretty good. I've still got costs for other things like, uh, like uh, ELB and, it's not ELB, uh, RDS and stuff, but I'm looking at eliminating those as well. So what are we working on at the moment? We're trying to get better documentation. We're improving speed and stability. We're trying to think of a, a recommended method of creating your own runtimes. Like I said, you've got two options right now. Uh, one is to use the, that third-party company's Breath extensions uh, library, or you can clone Breath and do it yourself. And we want to have better framework integrations. And of course, a better deployment method from local. So the thing to do is join us. I, I don't even know what this photo is about. I, I found it on Unsplash, um, and I thought, well, I've got to use that. So, so join us, um, either at my builder, come and join me, come and work with me, come and talk to me, get on board with what we do, or get involved with the project, and tweet me, and let me know what you thought, or if, if there are any problems. Um, but please, dudes, get involved in the project, even if it is just to try it out and say, 
I think your documentation isn't clear here, or I tried this and it didn't quite work in my use case, what can we do about it? Um, and we'll try and take these things on board. Uh, but if you've got any questions now, do we have time? Yeah, we've just about got time before lunch, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, I'll do my best. Uh, I'm sorry, if I'm not wrong, Lambda had a limit for request size. Pre-signed URL fixes that for file upload, but is it still applicable that there was five megabytes or something like that? Ooh, you might be right there. Um, you know, I haven't looked into that. I knew there'd be something that I hadn't looked into that somebody would ask me. Um, you know, I will look into it and I will tweet it out and, uh, and, and get back to you on that because I, I, I simply don't have the, the, the answer on the top of my head, so. And I had the second question. Sure. So without forking breath, Without forking breath, it's yeah. impossible to custom uh, to install custom PHP extensions, right? It's not impossible, but you have to you have to fork. do it all all yourself. So right? you need to fork fork a breath and on. You, you don't need to fork breath. Um, you can just clone it and then run it yourself, and then what will happen is it will upload the the layers to your own account, right? So, yeah. so you won't be using breaths extensions that, that their official extension repository, but you'll have them uploaded to your own account, and you'll be able to. You'll be able to use mm. those. Thank you. Is there anybody else? I can't really see people at the back. Is anyone be there? Oh, we've, we've got somebody down the front yeah, here. Well, only me. Oh. Um, the request and payload for Lambda is 6 meg, um, just so you want to know that one. OK, thank you. Um, what's the difference between breath versus using stackeries, images, or serverless.com? Sure, okay, so um, the previous version of Breath used serverless, uh, and it wasn't, it wasn't a decision that, that I made. The, the guy who's running the, uh, who's leading the project, when the, when the layers came out, he said, look, Lambda is, is kind of the most ubiquitous thing that everyone's using, we should support that rather than trying to support everything. It's, it's the idea of getting rid of the kitchen sink and being opinionated so that we can do one thing and do it well. So that's why we don't do um, use serverless for the deployment anymore. There, with, with regard to uh, other options, I know that Rob Allen, who would have been here today, is, is working on something called Image to Lambda. I don't know a lot about that, but I think that that is something to do with taking your Docker containers and pushing that to Lambda and doing pretty much the same thing. Um, so that's another option. I haven't, I haven't really looked into it, so I don't, I don't really know. Um, but the point with Breath is that we do one thing and we optimize it for that and we do it well. And if you want to extend it and take it and run with it and, and do things like that, then you can do and you know that you've got a basic thing that's predictable that you can run with. Uh, I hope that kind of, kind of addresses your, your question there. Yep. I just have one question sure. about um, where I can get more technical information about how um, Breath uses Docker. I'm very interested in both subjects. So. Sure, okay, so, so, so Breath only uses Docker. Uh, in fact, it doesn't directly use Docker. It's uh, Sam Local, which uses Docker, which is the AWS package that, uh, that is provided by AWS for the deployment. So we don't actually do anything with Docker within Breath apart from the compilation, which I just lied to you about there. So yeah, so we, so we do compile PHP uh, for the layers with Docker, but we're not actually using Docker as, as part of the normal workflow. We're using um, AWS uh, SAM Local for that, which is completely separate. It's just that it's easier to use AWS's own tool for the, doing a deployment than it is to, to do that ourselves. Um, and what we do is we kind, of, we kind of set up the template for your AWS SAM deployment structure. That's, that's about as far as we go with, with that. Is there anybody else? No, good. Hi, uh, um, most probably being a bit naive, but um, sure. what's the pricing for Lambda? And, and is there a, a crossover where it's most probably just easier just to keep with a, a VPC? You know? Sure, okay. Um, 
Well, I showed you my own results there. I mean, my, my results there, they're very infrequently used websites. Uh, so I've, I've basically knocked my costs down to nothing. So I was spending about 150 pound a month just on load balances and, and EC2 instances. Um, and now it's, it's negligible. Up to a certain point, it's going to be cheaper um, to use Lambda, but I, th I think you're probably going to have to look at your use case and, and, and figure it out. So the costings are all provided on the AWS website, as I'm sure you, you can get the costings for EC2 and you can get the costings for Lambda, etc. It just takes a bit of rudimentary maths, I think, to say this is the amount of requests we get and this is like, how much it's, we project that it's going to cost. The thing about this as well, um, being behind API Gateway, is that you can configure API Gateway to, to block a bunch of requests that otherwise would get through. To if, you, if you've got um, maybe a set um, number of, uh, or, or a set of routes which are allowed into your application, you can say anything outside of that, which was in that, um, those, those proxy URLs in the template.yaml, you can say, you can get rid of the catcher and say, only allow these ones through that match. And then what happens is API Gateway blocks that at the edge, and you never even get charged for those to come through to Lambda. So you can probably optimize your costs in that respect, um, but I think you probably need to look at your own use case to figure out how much it's going to cost you, or maybe experiment with it.